recording. Great. Uh, so I'm very happy to introduce uh, Frank Garvin. Uh, will be speaking. Oh, I forget uh, what your title is. Um, there we go. Uh, who will be speaking about new symmetries for Dyson's rank function uh, and Zagier's higher order mock data functions. So take it away, Frank. All right. Thank you, Ian. And thank you, Larry, for the opportunity to speak. Okay, so this talk is probably too long. Um, I gave 10 talks last week to a conference in Texas and I've compressed them into an hour. I'm just kidding. But... <laughs> so Frank, I think I recognize the picture on the right. Is that the location? Is that last week? That's last week. That's uh, my student Rishab Sharma on the left and Jonathan Bradley Thrush on the right. Oh, Frank, are you recording? Sure. Um, is this recording? It is. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not sure exactly what, what's been covered in previous talks. Um, oh, just admit everybody. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a young picture of young Dyson. All right, so Dyson's rank conjecture goes back to 1944, but he actually posted it as a problem in the American Mathematical Monthly. I shall read it to you. Uh, the number of partitions of an integer n into a sum of positive integral parts is denoted by P of n. The result of subtracting the number of parts in a partition from the largest part is a positive or negative integer called the rank of the partition. Ramanujan proved that P of 5n plus 4 is always divisible by 5, and P of 7n plus 5 by seven. In your talk, it's important that you take a breath between sentences. <clears throat> Show that the number of partitions of item plus four whose ranks are congruent modulo five to a given residue is the same, whichever of the five residues is chosen. And the number of partitions of seven and plus five whose ranks are congruent mod seven to a given residue is the same whichever of the seven residues is chosen. Uh, this notation, you know? Okay, so here's an example of Dyson's rank. There's the five partitions of four. For example, all this partition here has two parts. Its largest part is three, three minus two is one. Um, so we've work out the rank of each of the five partitions of four, and you notice that mod five, all these numbers are different and occur equally often. Um, so let capital N of M and N denote the number of partitions of N with rank M. Um, here's a generating function. Here's a quick proof. You draw a Ferris diagram. In the top left-hand corner, you have a square which contributes q to the k squared. You look to the right of the Durfee square and you, the columns will form partitions whose, whose largest part is less than got a k, which is generated by this. And below the Durfee square with rows, you have partitions at most k as well with that. So the rank is this length minus that length, and that corresponds to the number of parts, columns in here minus the number of rows down here. Okay, so that explains the generating function quickly, which is, the, so there's three parts. That's the Durfee square, that's the bit to the right, and that's the bit below. Okay, so there's, so we've just seen that there's one for each residue mod five. So here in zero five comma four is the number of partitions of four, with rank congruent to zero and rank congruent to one, two, three, and four, they're all equal to one. Okay, so there's Dyson's conjectures, 1944, written in math symbols rather than words in the monthly. Um, these were proved by Ackerman, Swinton, Dyer, roughly 1953, 1954. Any questions? Pause again for a breath.
Okay, here's an interesting fact. Take the rank generating function and substitute Z a P root of unity, where P is a prime. Then the powers of zeta here um, clump together according to the residue of the exponent mod P, you collect terms and you get this. And what you'll notice is Dyson's first rank conjecture is the equivalent to the coefficient of this generating function, coefficient of Q to the five n plus four and here is zero. And similar thing for the seventh roots of unity with seven n plus four. That's because all these coefficients are integers and the minimal polynomial of this guy is just one plus zeta plus dot, 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 plus zeta to the P minus one equals zero. Right. So far so good. Oh, George Andrews. <laughs> George is right. You never know what's on the next slide. <laughs> okay, so when I was a PhD student at Penn State, George gave me this page to figure out. Uh, believe it or not, this equation here for little f is basically the p dissection of the rank function where you put z equal to a fifth root of unity. Okay, so here, oh, and there's the bottom of the page. Um, this guy here is actually one of the fifth order mock data functions. So you have an identity here involving phi and a. And if you look back at this identity here, you'll see phi and a in this equation. So what that means is, it means that this fifth order function is somehow related to the rank mod five. Well, of course, Ramanujan didn't know Dyson's rank and he didn't have a combinatorial bent. Okay, here, here I've rewritten the identity in LaTeX. Uh, the function, <clears throat> functions A, B, C, and D are basically modular forms. Uh, the phi and psi are related to mock data functions. The interesting thing is this identity at the top of the screen there is equivalent to the main theorem in Akinet's Winner and Dyer's paper. So another amazing. Some people say that Ramanujan reaches out of the grave and steals the theorems. Okay. okay, so here's the identity. This is a fifth order function. And here's the um, relationships I put before. If you turn that in terms of rank, um, here we're looking at the rank of five N. And if you simplify it, you will, it'll reduce to this identity here. Uh, since all the coefficients are integers, you just equate coefficients of zeta here. Um, you get these two identities here. And this basically gives the fifth, one of the fifth order mock data conjectures. So that means the generating, the, this is the chi zero is one of the fifth order functions. And the conjecture is that the coefficients of this guy are this difference of ranks. Of five n. Okay, so this was proved by Dean Hickerson in 1988. Okay, which brings us to a quote that Dyson made at the 1987 conference. I was there. Was anybody else at the 1987 conference in in Illinois? You were there, You're, right? Of course, Cindy. You were there. No one else. Wow. <coughs> It's 100. Yeah, I know. That means I'm getting old. Okay. <laughs> uh, the quote, the mock data functions give us tantalizing hints of a grand synthesis still to be discovered. Somehow it should be possible to build them into a coherent group structure analogous to the structure of modular forms which Hecker built around the old theta functions of Jacobi. This remains a challenge for the future. Yes, Dean, I'm going to let you in. Does that mean you've disappeared? Oh. All right. 
So maybe unbeknownst to Dyson, but many of Ramanujan's Moncleta functions are very strongly connected to Dyson's rank function. In fact, all of the third order functions, the ones in his letter and the other ones by Watson, are, can be written explicitly in terms of the rank function. Okay, so in 2010, in addressing Dyson's challenge, Bringman and Ono studied transformation properties of the rank function when z equals a root of unity. So now I'm going to talk about how that identity in Ramanujan's lost notebook can be generalized. Uh, remembering that the identity, there was a phi and a psi function. Uh, the generalization of that for primes bigger than three is this guy here, uh, which depends on how big A is, kind of funny. Um, so here's, so let's look at this function here. Remember, this function here is the rank function with z equal to a pth root of unity. This is the right power of q to multiply by. And here we have a linear combination of these phi functions. So these are basically mock theta functions. And this is the rank function at a root of unity. Okay, so in this paper, I proved that if you multiply by eta, P squared Z, this is a weakly holomorphic modular form of weight one on the grid gamma zero P squared intersect gamma one. Okay. Um, Bringman and Ono uh, didn't restrict to a prime um, and they have a result. There's the rank function again, and here's the non-holomorphic part here as a harmonic mass form of weight one half. Their group is a bit smaller than mine. All right, anyway. So my result is, for a prime, my result is a generalization of it, or, an, or a stronger result. Um, so here I've rewritten it. This is the rank generating function at a root of unity. Um, it's nice if you multiply by this. Uh, over here, we have a period integral involving a theta function. I won't write out its definition. Okay, so Bringman and Ono proved that uh, this guy here was one component of a vector valued harmonic mass form of weight one half on SL2C. So the last talk was by um, Nick, Nick Anderson, who talked about vector valued uh, forms like this. Right? Nick, are you here? Oh, Nick actually uh, did uh, uh, Oh, that's okay. You can watch the recording. Yes. Um, so this proof was simplified by Zagi. So here's another theorem. Here I'm taking the partitions of Pn minus Sp. What's Sp is this. Um, that's basically the inverse of 24 mod P. So on that residue class, if I multiply by Qp, Qp infinity, this is a weakly holomorphic modular form of break one on gamma one of P. Um, and this improves the result of Algren and Trenier. Okay, so we also look at other parts of the P dissection. So it depends on the character of minus 24M mod P. When it's zero or a quadratic non-residue, we look at this function here. Uh, when it's a quadratic residue, we need to subtract off one of these phi functions. So A is chosen so that this is true. And then the theorem is that for the special case KP zero, um, I've already stated this result already. Uh, for the other residue classes, um, it's a modular form of weight one on gamma of P, but it also transforms nicely on gamma one of P um, like that. Any questions? Uh, I'm just reminding you of the stroke operator. Anyway, so F is a function of Z, A is a matrix with positive determinants. Um, so in work with my student, Rishab, uh, we've, ex we've gone further from gamma one of P to gamma zero of P, and we have this, Nice transformation here. 
So this take, you go from one residue class, M mod P, to this residue class here, M A squared mod P. Um, the interesting thing is that the root of unity changes from zeta to zeta to the D. A pith root of unity is involved, a plus or minus signs involved, and a quotient of signs is involved. You might think, this doesn't look right. Well, this turns out to be a cyclotomic unit. So you shouldn't work. Uh, so here's a problem. Uh, we want to find identities for these P dissections. That gives an analog of Ramanujan's identity. So as building blocks, we use these theta functions here. I'm using some results of Biojoli. This is basically Jacobi's triple product. Uh, it transforms nicely under gamma zero P by this formula. The theta multiplier is just the cube of the eta multiplier, which Nick mentioned. Uh, so we use these sorts of things as building blocks. So for each vector like this, we form a, a product of these theta functions. And basically we want theta, these theta functions to transform like our KPMs. And all we gotta do is check three conditions. Um, and once we have that, a function like that, we know how it transforms. But wait, okay, I'm sorry I'm going too fast. So the way it, gamma zero P acts on this thing, it actually permutes these coordinates. Basically what we're doing is we're taking an I mod P and sending it to A times I mod P, but modulo plus or minus. Um, so here we have a theorem here. Suppose you've got an identity for one of these KPMs in terms of some theta functions. Uh, where these coefficients are cyclotonic bits. Uh, then you can get another residue class by basically use a matrix, but here's the result. The coefficients here change from zeta to the zeta sub p to zeta to the a. You get this funny question of signs and you get another plus or minus term. Okay, so what does it mean? It means if you want to write down Ramanujan's identity for any prime, then you only need to find three bits. You need to find the KP zero bit. You need to find the KPM bit just for one quadratic residue and the KPM minus for one quadratic non-residue. And then those three bits of information will give you the entire P dissection using the previous theorem. So here's an example. I've rewritten Ramanujan's result. Uh, there's no KP zero term that corresponds to partitions of five M plus four. And you'll notice some symmetry. The K51 looks very much like the K54, the K52 and the K53 look so similar. And we can predict what these coefficients have to be. Uh, here's the analog of the seven dissection. As George Andrews pointed out, this was not in Ramanujan's lost notebook, but it's not hard to figure out. This time you'll have three phi functions on the left-hand side, you'll have um, the term seven n plus five is missing on the right. So that gives you Dyson's rank conjecture, but you see symmetry, you'll see groups of three. This guy, this guy, and this guy, and that guy, that guy, and that guy. So there's three quadratic residues, three quadratic non-residues mod seven. And there they are, there. So you can see um, some symmetry. Now there's more. Here we're looking at KP zero. If you can write KP zero as a sum of these theta functions, um, how are they generated? First of all, you'll need to find a bunch of vectors so that this set of functions is linearly independent. Otherwise you just throw some of them away. But here, each one of these vectors act, gets acted on by a permutation that comes from gamma zero of P. So basically you need T functions for free 
you get p minus one over two times t functions. So suppose you have an identity like this, which experimentally, and we've proved it, uh, that this can be done for p equals five, seven, 11, 13, 17, and 19. Uh, I guess we got a bit queasy going to the next prime. But anyway, these coefficients must satisfy some interesting symmetry. Suppose you know, so for each one of these T functions, just pick any one of them. So you're picking a K between one and T and pick one of the coefficients. Change zeta to zeta to the D, multiply by this, and it'll give you the other coefficients in the identity. Let me illustrate this with a dramatic example. Okay, there is the identity for k 11 zero. So this is the petitions of 11 n plus six and we're dissecting the rank model 11. Um, this was done by Akin and Hussain in 1958 with his student Hussain. Um, I asked this people in Texas, did they notice any symmetry in these coefficients? And I have to tell you, it's hard to see the symmetry, but let me show you where the symmetry is. Okay, I'm rewriting the coefficients. Here's the first guy. How do we get from the first guy to the second guy? We just change zeta to zeta squared. We multiply this quotient, sine 11 pi over 11 divided by sine 2 pi over 11, and then we have to use the formula to work out if it's plus or minus. So now you see the symmetry in the coefficients. So this is the first part of my talk, uh, new symmetries for the Dyson rank function. Okay, so Akin and Hussain didn't know this is symmetry, but if you look at that result there, you don't see the symmetry, right? You've just got to, re you've got to rewrite it like that. And now you'll see the symmetry. Has anybody seen anything like this before? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now we get to the next part of my talk. Um, here are the three mock data functions of order seven, F0, F1, F2. Ramanujan says, all he says is these three guys are not related. Uh, well, here are the seventh order of mock data conjectures written analytically. This G function down here is like my phi function. Um, it's a value of, of the RZQ as the rank generating function. J, I'm using Hickerson's notation. Uh, Jacobi's theta function, we're using J, the triple product there. So I think Nick Anderson had these three in his talk earlier, right? Maybe he had the fifth order ones, not the seventh. Anyway, there's a combinatorial way to look at the rank, seventh order rank conjecture. That means the difference between these two ranks can be counted um, according to the coefficients of a seventh order function. So gamma zero is the coefficient of F zero. And here's a dramatic example. Put n equal to seven. Uh, these two numbers are quite big. Take the difference. The difference is two, and there are two relevant partitions that you count. Anyway, I, I apologize if I'm going through this quickly. I should take a sip, right? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I wanted to highlight. Anderson's work here. So alternative proofs of the seventh order mock data conjectures and the fifth order ones uh, was proven by Anderson using the Vey representation stuff and the theory of harmonic mass forms. Crucial in that proof was this result here. Here, here I've got three, the three functions of order seven. Um, the R7 here is the completion, which you can write in terms of incomplete gamma functions. 
Uh, this part is easy, changing tau to tau plus one. What's interesting is when you send tau to minus one over tau, you get this result here, right? So I don't think Nick Anderson explicitly gave the transformation, but this is what it looks like. So this reformulation is due to Zagier. Um, this is Zagier's paper. Ramana, this is 2007. Ramanujan's mock theta functions and their applications, Dapri, Zvegas, and Brigman Ono. Um, so Zagi also states an analog for the fifth order functions, chi zero and chi one. In Nick Anderson's talk, he didn't look at chi zero and chi one, but in a lot of ways, chi zero and chi one are much nicer than the little f zeros and the big f zeros and ones. So here's the result. Here's the holomorphic part. Here's the non-holomorphic part. And this part is easy, but tau going to minus one over tau has this nice matrix of signs. Take a sip. Oh. Okay, now if you look further into Zagi's paper, you'll see this paragraph. Here he's talking about something that he calls a Mach Eisenstein series. Uh, we'll skip that, but down here he's got this. The M7J are, are basically the three mock data functions of order seven. If you multiply them by eta cubed, you get this funny looking thing. And he calls this an indefinite theta series of weight two. Well, the mock data functions of order seven are the holomorphic part of harmonic mass forms of weight a half. Eta has weight one half. So this in total has weight three halves plus a half, which is two. So explicitly I've written it out. On the left-hand side, this is the first seventh order function. Uh, these are chronic symbols. Sine just means it's plus one if n is greater than equal to zero and minus one if it's negative. I'd like to see a Q series proof of this. So Zagi just states this. Go down a bit and it gives you an idea of the proof. What's more, by methods obtained in a reasonably straightforward way, by generalizing methods from standard modular form theory, holomorphic projection, rankin cohen brackets, one can produce infinitely many new examples. So that's all he says. And here's a, here's a, here's ex, here is his example of 11th order functions. Okay, so here is my 11th order mock theta conjecture. Here is the first of Zagier's 11th order function here, right? Here is my phi function. It's a value, it's the rank function basically when Q goes to QD11 and Z equals Q squared, basically. Then the coefficients of this mock theta function are 11 times this rank function minus P. Of, you would expect the number of partitions of 11N with rank congruent to zero mod 11 is about 1 11th of those guys. So this should be small minus these coefficients. So here's an example. Uh, and here are the coefficients down here. So this just illustrates the theorem. Any questions? Okay. Ooh. So the crucial thing is holomorphic projection. What is holomorphic projection? I guess I don't have to remind you about the slash operator. Oh, I called it the stroke operator before. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Some people call it the slash. Some of you will call it the stroke. Okay, so M twiddle K is basically the space of C infinity functions that transform like modular forms and they satisfy a cusp condition here. Um, N sub K is basically a subspace of that that sort of looks like cusp forms. So they have a better thing here. 
Uh, this notation is due to John Coates, who wrote a summary of Zagier's stuff. Okay, so what's holomorphic projection? So holomorphic projection is a projection from this space of non-holomorphic modular functions onto the space of cusp forms so that the cusp forms are invariant. The crucial theorem is the Reese representation well, the Reese representation theorem and the Peterson inner product. Okay. Um, so to cut a long story short, if you've got this non-holomorphic function and it's got a Fourier expansion like this, here this is a Fourier expansion in the real variable x. The coefficients depend on the imaginary part y. Um, here there are coefficients here in terms of some integrals depending on the weight. Then the holomorphic projection um, can be written like this, where it satisfies um, the right condition under the Peterson inner product. Okay. So you want to extend the definition to holomorphic functions. Well, you want to extend it to anything that looks like this and just use these coefficients. And if you do that, then if it's holomorphic, it just leaves it alone. And the proof is kind of simple. Um, so Olivia Beckwith, Raum and Richter have a recent paper where they look at holomorphic projection where the functions aren't periodic with period one. So they are like level N. Um, then uh, they satisfy some cusp conditions here. Um, then the holomorphic projection is given by a similar formula here. And they basically state that if it's holomorphic, it preserves the function. And um, basically we concentrate on weight two. So if it transforms like a weight two modular form, it's holomorphic projection is a quasi modular form of weight two. And if you're lucky, it's an honest to God modular form, not a quasi. All right. So, Here's a lemma. This is basically corresponding to a non-holomorphic part of a weak mass form, and we're multiplying by some series. Uh, then the holomorphic projection looks like this, but when it's weight two, it simplifies to this. Um, this is interesting because this does not converge as a formal power series because for fixed values of this difference, there are usually infinitely many solutions. Okay, but you actually want to get rid of these square roots and you want to make it a formal power series. You don't want to be like this. So you use this cute theorem of Andrew Sickerson and Dyson that tells you if you want to find solutions to this equation here, you just find a fundamental solution and then all the other solutions are equivalent to one in this in these ranges and all the solutions, once you've got them in that range, all the other solutions are given by this. Okay, so this is just a bit of arithmetic in an imaginary quadratic field, right? Was it real? It's real, right, yeah, get real. <laughs> um, so quite often we can simplify the holomorphic projection to something that looks like this. Um, so let's get let's get going with um, the higher order mock beta functions. Okay, so again we're going back to the rank function here. This is the harmonic mass of weight one half to do with the rank function. We also need this guy here. Remember, this is our phi function. And these are just theta functions here. What? So yeah, this one is quite nice. In fact, Nick Anderson wrote this one down, except uh, without the character there. Well, maybe he won't run. His one was weight one half, was it? Not three half. So this is the three half version and related to the rank. And here's the definition of the phi function again. Here Q of of course, is e to the two pi i z. 
Okay, so I'm reiterating my theorem from before. These functions are harmonic mass forms of weight one half on that group. Now, what's extremely nice is that this theta function is related to these theta functions here. Um, the proposition is that this guy G1 is related to these G, a linear combination of G2s modulo a holomorphic part. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the non-holomorphic part, multiply by eta cubed, and then take the holomorphic projection. Uh, was anybody at Zagier's conference in Bonn in 2008? Nobody was there either. Okay. <laughs> Amanda, you went there? I <laughs> Well, I confess that this idea was in Zagier's talk. I was taking notes. I didn't understand what he was doing at the time, but now I do. Okay. All right. Okay. So here we're just using the formula we had before to work out the holomorphic projection. Um, I'm going to skip the proof. Um, here I'm just pointing out if you actually truncate their series, and we've got the coefficients. The coefficients are not integers, but if you multiply by three halves, they look like they're close to integers. If I round them, divide by eight Q infinity cubed, I get this, and use OEIS, they are the coefficients of chi zero, the fifth order function. Anyway, um, so what does all that mean? It means that that holomorphic projection looks like it's there's too many threes there. <laughs> eta cubed of tau times this fifth order function. Okay. Okay, so this is a corollary. So what is this? This is Zagi's idea. You take the non-holomorphic part of one of these harmonic mass forms, you multiply by something of weight three halves, that's nice. You take its holomorphic projection and then you divide by it this is your new mock data function. And by the theorem, that's what its coefficients look like. Okay, not totally nice, but we'll improve it. Um, now what's nice here? So we know that G2 transforms into G1. So Zagier also hinted at this. What you should do is you should take your harmonic mass form and, and multiply by this and subtract off the holomorphic projection. And now you've got something that transforms like a modular form of weight two, but of course it's holomorphic. Is it? No. No, 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 that's wrong, okay. Anyway, um, so, All right, so here I'm applying z goes to minus one over z to this, and I'll just give you the result. Right, so here you take this m star thing that you constructed by taking the harmonic mass form times eta cubed minus its holomorphic projection, then divide by eta tau cubed, then it transforms like that. So this, looks, this should look familiar to you, right? This looks like what happens for order five and order seven. Um, so now, uh, this is what, I mean, I've just rewritten it. So you've got this matrix of signs. This is how you transform this thing from tau goes to minus one over two. And each one of these harmonic mass forms of weight one half is proportional to this shadow. Okay, now what about this concocted mock data function? Here's a better expression for its Q expansion. This does converge as a formal power series. This identity is due to my student, Jonathan Bradley Thrush. It's not easy to get this thing to work out. It depends on Alpha, beta, and epsilon. 
So alpha, beta is the fundamental solution of this and epsilon is a plus and minus one according to this. Okay, so what you do is now you take, you notice that this function here and that function there have the same non-holomorphic part. Now I know what to do. Now you subtract. So now you've got a modular form that trans, now you've got something that transforms like a modular form of weight one half, but it's holomorphic. So here you have your new mock theta function and you have this phi function. And the theorem is that this should be a weakly holomorphic modular form. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Here's an example. Okay, so this is P equals five, A equals one. Here is our concocted mock theta function using Zagier's idea explicitly. And the theorem says this should be a weakly holomorphic modular form of weight one half. It seems to be that it's equal to this. Um, this is most likely true. I mean, there's something to, we haven't actually rigorously done all the details, but um, I confess to that, but I think, um, And this is a Q series version. I'd like to see a Q series proof that this thing up here simplifies to the fifth order mock beta function. Um, okay, here's some more examples. Here's the other fifth order function, chi zero, is basically this guy here. These three things here, these are actually the seventh order mock theta conjectures written in another way. Here's the 11 case. So here's the concocted mock theta function of order 11. The theory basically tells us that this should be a modular form of weight one half weakly holomorphic and experimentally it looks like that. These are generalized eta products. Um, modulo some details, which I think can be worked out. Um, I don't know how I've done it, but I've gone through 101 slides. I apologize if it was not too fast, but I've tried to take a breath between thoughts. Okay. Uh, I should point out that Zagi has another paper Ramanujan had Hardy von Ersten bis zum letzten Brief, which is Ramanujan to Hardy from the first letter to the last letter. And towards the end of his paper, it's all in German. Um, you can see here's his definition of this higher order mock theta function, quite like what we have, but I believe this is not exactly correct. Um, I think I've tried this for different primes and I'm not sure if these coefficients are right. Uh, if you read further in the paper in German, it says he just discovered this five days before he gave this talk. Um, and if you go to his other paper, the Bubaki paper, his formula for the 11th thing is not consistent with this formula, um, but something like this is true. But when you read this paper here, he just throws that into the paper and it doesn't say where he got it or what it is, right? But anyway, you know, you, it's a good idea to read Zagier's papers. And even if you don't understand them, you're, it's a worthwhile experience trying to understand what is going on. And he gives you some little hints. Uh, what to do? Timekeeper, how many minutes do I have left? I got five minutes left. Whoa, I, I went too fast. I'm sorry. Uh, is there any, anything you want me to go back to? I can, I'm happy to go back. Well, you can go back to where you multiply by eta cube and then do the whole To go way back, way back, way back. So first of all, 
here is the harmonic mass form of weight one half. This is the rank function here. If you go and look in Bremen and Ono's paper, they'll tell you what that theta function is. You also need this G2 function. Um, theta one is nice, it looks like this. Here's phi. And what is, what is going on? Uh, what is going on is we're taking the non-holomorphic part with Z changed to PZ, multiplying by eta tau cubed. So now we have something of weight two. We take its holomorphic projection and we get some formula for the coefficients. Maybe this is another question of why, why did you say the cube? Like I know you want some weight three of two, but why? Right, well, the nicest thing of weight three halves, I believe is it's a cusp form, right? So I wouldn't take a not. Uh -oh. A cusp form is better, better to multiply by a cusp form than multiply by something that's not a cusp form. My, my question is what if you decide to take a rank cohen bracket, which with not necessarily cusp form because you know. Right, yeah. Because if you take the high order, like you'll end up with a cusp form anyway if the, I mean, behave with the cusp. So what could that give us? Yeah, you could, could do, I have, we did not do that, but you could do that. Um, Michael Mertens has a thesis where he does that for, um, he takes harmonic mass forms of weight one half and multiplies them by something of weight three halves and harmonic mass forms of weight three halves and multiplies them by something of weight one half and takes the holomorphic projection and that rank and column bracket stuff. Oh. And he has some. That's where I got the idea from, because that's where he proves Cohen's projection using the projection. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'm not sure what happens with the rank function. Because we need to probably like multiply by, or not multiply, take rank from the theta function, theta function. I mean, I feel like it behaves very useful. Right. It might behave better than this thing. Um, it's a bit tricky when the weight is two. Yeah, but, but we can take the order of the rank going back to be big. That's not very big. Right, but here I'm not- to throw it inside. I'm just saying it's tricky here because I'm not doing the right ranking current bracket. Oh, okay. Right, so. I think let's take the break for his talk. Are there any other questions? I have a comment and I want to thank Frank and Cindy for making a heroic effort to come here. <laughs> We've been talking about Frank gave 10 lectures and his, some of you may know uh, flights got messed up and, and Frank and Cindy drove 17 hours here in one day. And so we're very glad that you were, that you made such an effort. And were able to Thanks, Barry. Thanks. Definitely. We, we, definitely we love tennis. <laughs> Our granddaughters live here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, any other questions or comments? I guess I have a quick question, which is maybe because I lost track of notation. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. No, uh, so this is not a well formed question, but all of these uh, uh, mock data functions should, is it correct that they should somehow be related to like a P dissection of the rank or should you be able to tease that information out of them? Or is that not quite right? Um, well, all the third order functions can be written in terms of the rank function, but they're not occurring as part of a three dissection. Um, uh, and Mander gave a talk on, I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, universal mock theta functions, right? So there's other way, there's other things like the rank function, the universal mock theta functions that are connected with these mock theta functions as well. So. But I, I don't know. I mean, uh, 
I mean, is, is G2 here the same, or maybe it was G1 that was built out of the, the, the rank function? Oh, I guess that's right. right. The G1 is built out of the rank function. Now, when you start hitting this with SL2Z, right, you're going to create new functions. One of them will be this G2. And then you'll hit, you'll send Z to Z plus one and hit that with Z goes to one as well. You'll, you'll create more. So I'm not, I can't remember how many are in the complete set. There's probably some constant times P. Uh, But I was oh no, I didn't go too far. I'm looking for Zagi. He's every place. Modular forms are everywhere. <laughs> Oh, I've lost him. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. But he does say form. Some family of functions. Yeah, you've got this M sub P A where A goes from one up to half P minus one. And you can complete it to go on the other side of P minus one over two. And he says you take the negative. And then these are vector valued things. Um, it's amazing how much these constructions for the degree to level go down. Yeah, I mean, this, how did Ramanujan come up with? I know I can't find it. Crikey. Well, you said he stole them from the grave. I mean, some, some TV channels would say it was the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, doesn't he come from the grave to steal others? <laughs> uh, yeah. So the components of M7, the holomorphic part, is basically the three seventh order functions. So Ramanujan says they're not related. Well, actually, they're whole, they are related by that matrix if you send tau to minus one by tau, but that's not Ramanujan, what Ramanujan th thought of as being related. <laughs> but this, but I mean, how did he know those were the right three things? I mean, uh, George does give us some, um, maybe some clue. It's a miracle. All right, uh, if there are no other questions, let's, oh, oh, if not, uh, let's thank Frank again.